Amen. Good morning and welcome to week four of Exploring LDS History, where we are doing our best we can do in this class to take a thorough and deep look at the history of the LDS Church, but at the same time, uh, we are trying the very best we can to be respectful and to be loving, but at the same time to be honest. And on, uh, the obvious fact in this class is that as evangelical Christians, we are going to differ with our LDS friends and our LDS neighbors who may be watching this online who are, or who may be in this class this morning. We are going to differ on some very key uh, and very important parts in this history as we go along. And so I'm trying the very best I can. I want to be guided by Scripture. I want to be faithful to Scripture. And I want to keep this Scripture in Colossians chapter 4 to the best of my ability, which says, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer every person. The highest calling we have as followers of Jesus is defending the truth and defending the gospel and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And we're talking about in this class the most important questions in life. How do we know Jesus and who is Jesus? And so in doing so, I want to be gracious um, as I can possibly, possibly be, even though we will disagree. If I was having a discussion with a Hindu person or a Buddhist person or an atheist, we are going to have points where we disagree on the big questions of life. But in discussing those differences, we always want to be gracious, and we always want to be loving. And when talking with our friends, our neighbors, and our family members who are members of the LDS Church, even though we disagree, and we may disagree greatly, we want to always be gracious in answering and in defending the gospel and the freedom that we have in Jesus. So that's our goal. That's our goal every week in this class as we look at the history of the church. And so just brief recap of where we've come in the last three weeks. We've looked at this, the first vision of Joseph Smith that took place in 1820 uh, when God the Father and Jesus Christ appeared to him, told him not to join any of the churches and that they were all corrupt. Then in 1823, Uh, The second vision where the angel Moroni appeared to him five different times over a period of about 24 hours revealed to him the location of the golden plates but said, you can't go get the plates yet, you have to wait. And he didn't retrieve the plates until 1827. So we've looked at the evidence for that first and second vision and you can go back and watch the first few weeks if you missed those. What we're doing now is going back and looking at that period from 1820 when he had that first vision, and to 1827 when he um, received the golden plates and began translating them, what was going on in Joseph Smith's life in that period of time. And so we looked at last week where we left off that um, history is very clear, multiple, multiple accounts by friendly and unfriendly witnesses that Joseph Smith was occupied at least in part in making his living in that period of time as a money digger. And which was a term for people who attempted to find hidden treasure that was supposedly all over the place. And he had his seer stones that he used in doing that. And I'm going to go, I know I I said last week at the end we were going to pick up talking about masonry and magic, but I've kind of reordered things this week and trying to tell it in the best format um, where the story flows. I want to continue along this line with maybe the most famous instance of Joseph Smith's uh, money digging, or at least the most important in terms of our story and in terms of his life and what actually led to him stopping the practice of money digging. And so we're going to look at this today. And what we see in this time period is this transformation of Joseph Smith from a money digger who is uh, in the practice of finding buried treasure for profit where we see this shift and we see this transition over time from him doing this same kind of practice for money, for profit, to becoming a prophet with a P-R-O-P-H-E-T, prophet. And you can kind of see when when you put all of the historical record together, you can see this transformation taking place. Here's what one historian said. He said, Smith went through two critical transformations. 
He began his engagement with the supernatural as a village conjurer, but transformed himself into a prophet of the word, announcing the opening of a new dispensation. And we'll see that happen over the next couple, couple weeks, where it ceases to be a money-making opportunity for him, and he begins speaking in terms of being a prophet of God. We talked about last week, it was very well known that Smith used seer stones in this money, bake, money digging venture. We know historically he had at least two seer stones that he used. This is his brown seer stone that's in possession of the church today, and this image came from, um, they finally released images of his brown seer stone in 2016. And so this is the most prominent stone that he used in the translation of the Book of Mormon. And again, my point in going back and looking at this period is not to try to belittle the character of Joseph Smith, but to show the connection between what he was doing from 18 to 20 to 1827 and what he started doing in 1827. And so he used this brown seer stone in his money-making ventures as a money digger, and he used the same brown seer stone in translation of the Book of Mormon a few years later. We also know that he had a white seer stone, but the provenance of that stone is not as well known. It's possible the church has it still in its possession, but they just haven't uh, released that they do. We know that the white seer stone, after they had moved to Utah, one of the leaders in the church had it, and they put it in the capstone of one of the temples in southern Utah, somewhere along the way, and, but then it was removed from there, and it's kind of not clear where it went from there. But we know he had a brown stone and a white stone, and both of those will come up in our story today. We're going to look at one specific instance that led to kind of a turning point in Joseph Smith's life and in his career as a money digger. You might remember Josiah Stowell's name came up last week in, in some of the accounts we looked at, and he's a prominent figure today. So this is Lucy Smith, Joe's mom. This is her account of what happened in 1825, and this is where Josiah Stowell comes into our story. She said in her autobiography that a short time before the house they were living in was completed in 1825, a man by the name of Josiah Stowell, and you'll see his last name spelled several different ways today, a man by the name of Josiah Stowell came from Chenago County, New York, with the view of getting Joseph to assist him in digging for a silver mine. He came for Joseph on account of having heard that he possessed certain keys by which he could discern things invisible to the natural eye. So this is a really interesting statement to me for a couple reasons. Number one, this is his mama who was in a better position to know than anybody, and she'll come up again later, but she's admitting here he had this supernatural gift and ability that she never apologized for. She was proud of him. Uh, she was a believer in all of these kinds of things herself, and she believed that her son had the gift. And so she openly admits that he had this supernatural ability to see things with his seer stones. The other interesting thing, though, to me is it shows he had enough of a reputation that Josiah Stowell came from a neighboring county that he had heard of Joseph Smith's reputation enough that he sought him out. He came specifically to meet him and to find him and to uh, employ him in his money digging ventures. So a couple interesting things from Lucy there. So Smith moves to Harmony, Pennsylvania with Stowell to assist him in finding this lost silver mine. Uh, they're actually digging, it's right on the border there, they're digging in New York, but staying in Harmony, Pennsylvania. And while there, they boarded with a man named Isaac Hale, who put up his money digging group in his house. And Isaac Hale had a cute young daughter named Emma Hale. And Joseph met her, and they fell madly in love. The problem was her father, Isaac, didn't approve of the relationship at all. He didn't approve of, uh, he thought Joseph Smith was a fraud and a charlatan. He didn't approve of the way he was uh, trying to earn money. He didn't buy into any of it, so he didn't approve of his dating his daughter. And we'll come back to their story in a little bit today. 
But here's what he said about Joseph Smith at the time. So this is Emma's dad. Smith was boarding with him while there looking for this buried treasure. He said that Smith at that time was in the employ of a set of men who were called money diggers. And his occupation was that of seeing or pretending to see by means of a stone placed in his hat with his hat closed over his face. And in this way, he pretended to discover minerals and hidden treasure. We've noticed those details before. You might remember from other people, right? And I want you to remember those because it's going to come up later. That he would put his brown seer stone in his hat and hold his hat up to his face, and that's when things would supernaturally be revealed to him through the stone. And so he gives the same account that we saw last week. He said in another account, this was in a newspaper in 1834, he said Smith's appearance at this time was that of a careless man, not very well educated, and very saucy and insolent to his father. So he didn't like the way Smith treated his dad. Smith and his father with several other money diggers boarded at my house while they were employed in digging for a mine that they supposed to have been opened, was supposed to have been opened and worked by the Spaniards many years since. Young Smith gave the money diggers great encouragement at first, but when they had arrived in digging to near the place where he had stated an immense treasure would be found, he said that the enchantment was so powerful that he couldn't see anymore, and they became discouraged and soon after dispersed. So that's a story we heard before last week, right? They dug and dug and dug and dug, and when you get to where the treasure is supposed to be, something always happens. It moves deeper into the earth. The spirits make the enchantment so strong you can't see it or you just can't get to it. And so they never could get to this treasure. They got discouraged. They eventually quit. Here's what Martin Harris said. You might remember Martin we met last week. This is a friendly witness. He's maybe the most ardent believer Joseph Smith ever had early on. Uh, man, he believed. And he believed Joseph Smith had the gift. And so uh, he said that when Joseph Smith found this stone, there was a company digging in Harmony, Pennsylvania, and they took Joseph to look in the stone for them. And he did so for a while, and then he told them the enchantment was so strong that he couldn't see anymore, and they gave it up. So he cor corroborates all of the same details of what went on. I love this account from Alva Hale. So this is Emma's brother, Isaac's son. So Joseph was staying at their house. Here's what he said. And he wasn't so upset about what they were doing so much as that Smith was lazy with his complaint. Joe Smith never handled one shovel of earth in those diggings. And that's what made him mad. All that Smith did was to peep with stone and hat and give directions on where and how to dig and when and where the enchantment moved the treasure. Smith said that if he should work with his hands at digging there, he would lose the power to see with the stone. So he was more upset that he found Smith to be lazy, and he didn't like manual labor. And um, so he said, I can't, I can't, I can't, I would love to help you guys, but I can't. If I work, I'll lose the ability to be able to see. But he corroborates the, all of the same information. So we've got all of these witnesses that are all in agreement that he worked for Stowell and digging for treasure, right? And they all, they're all saying essentially the same thing. But they did eventually get discouraged and they quit. And so Smith went to go stay with Stowell in his home in Bainbridge, New York, and he continued to work for him there on his farm. And he, for about five or six months, he worked for him on his farm. This is his house, which is still there in Bainbridge, New York today, which you can go and visit. Problem was, in that five or six month period, Stowell's sons got more and more upset with Smith because they were convinced he was robbing their poor gullible father, you know, blind. And he's wasting away all of their inheritance, giving the money to Joseph Smith. And so they didn't like having Smith around. And so in March of 1826, a neighbor named Peter Bridgman, who also happened to be Stowell's nephew, uh, they had Smith arrested on charges of being a disorderly person and an um, imposter. And so Smith was actually arrested for fraud and for trying to defraud Stowell. Flat, fast, forward, fast forward to 1873. So from 1830 to 1873, 
The church denies, 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 denies that Smith was ever a money digger. 1873, this account comes out in Fraser's magazine, giving the details of the trial and from his arrest. So this is 50 years after the trial took place. And what happened was there was a lady who came out to Salt Lake. She was researching the history of the church, and she bumped into the niece of Judge Neely, who was the judge that presided over the trial, and the niece was able to give her Judge Neely's notes, basically the trial transcript from that trial. And she had that trial transcript published in Fraser's Magazine in 1873. This is a lengthy account, but I think the details are worth mentioning, so bear with me. I'm going to read through these, but we learn a lot of important stuff from this. So here's what Judge Neely's trial record says. The prisoner was brought before the court on March 20th, 1826. The prisoner was examined under oath, and he says that he came from the town of Palmyra, that he had been at the house of Josiah Stowell in Bainbridge most of the time since, that he had a small part of the time been employed in looking for mines, but the major, point, major part had been employed by said Stowell on his farm and going to school. Here's the important part. He said that he had a certain stone which he had occasionally looked at to determine where hidden treasures in the bowels of the earth were, and that he professed to tell in this manner where gold mines were a distance underground. So you have Joseph Smith saying under oath here, yep, I do have a stone and I have used it to look for buried treasure. That he had looked for Mr. Stowell several times and informed him where he could find these treasures, and Mr. Stowell had been engaged in digging for them, that at Palmyra he pretended to tell by looking at this stone where coined money was buried in Pennsylvania, and while at Palmyra had frequently ascertained in that way where lost property was of various kinds, that he had occasionally been in the habit of looking through his stone to find lost property for three years, but, had late, but of late, as of late had given it up because it, he said it was hurting his eyes. So he hadn't been doing it recently. So that's a big admission there, if this really happened, as, as this record says, because he's admitting under oath here, yes, I have done it. I've done it not just here, but I've also done it in New York, and I've also done it in Pennsylvania, and I've done it in Palmyra, and I've been engaged in doing it for three years, which bumps us back to 1822, 1823, when supposedly uh, Moroni had appeared to him. He says, I've been engaged in this practice all of this time, and he openly admits it in court under oath. That's a big admission. So then they call Josiah Stowell to the stand, so he's going to testify on behalf of Joseph Smith. He's a friendly witness. He's there to defend Smith. He tries to help him, but from our perspective, looking back, he does more harm than good. But he's trying to be helpful. And he says under oath that the prisoner had been at his house something like five months. He'd been employed by him to work on the farm part of the time and that he pretended to have skill of telling where hidden treasures in the earth were by means of looking through a certain stone. And the prisoner had looked for him sometimes, once to tell him about money buried in Ben Mountain in Pennsylvania, and once for gold on Monument Hill, and once for a salt spring, and that he positively knew the prisoner could tell and did possess the art of seeing those valuable treasures through the medium of said stone. So Stowell says, on the stand... Yes, he does it, and I believe in his power, in his ability to be able to see things through his stone. He continued and said that the prisoner did offer his services, that he never deceived him, that the prisoner looked through the stone and described Josiah Stowell's house and outhouses while at Palmyra at Simpson Stowell's correctly. So when he went to Palmyra to, to visit Joseph to see about employing him, he says, he was able to look in his stone and describe my house and the buildings on my property before he had ever seen them before. And so that convinced him of his ability. That he had also told about a painted tree with a man's head painted upon it by means of the stone, and that he had been in the company with prisoner digging for gold and that and had the most implicit faith in the prisoner's skill. So he's, he's a believer. I believe he can do it, and he has done it, and he's done it for me. Okay, next his son takes the stand for the prosecution. 
Well, here's what his son said. They had gone to meet Joseph to see what was up. And he says that he went to see whether the prisoner could convince him that he possessed the skill he professed to have. Upon which the prisoner laid a book upon a white cloth and proposed by looking through another stone, which was white and transparent. So there's our white stone. Looking through the white and transparent stone, he would hold the stone to the candle, turn his head to the book and read. And he said to me, the deception appeared so palpable that the witness went off disgusted. Now, he didn't buy it, right? Joseph tried to convince him and he said, I, I ain't buying it. Another young man named McMaster who went with Stowell likewise came away disgusted. The prisoner pretended to him that he could discover objects at a distance by holding the white stone to the sun or candle, that the prisoner rather declined looking into a hat at his dark-colored stone as he said that it hurt his, uh, hurt his eyes. So he, he gives account there. We see both the white and his brown stone both being used. And he said, I ain't buying it either. Jonathan Thompson then comes to the sand and... Um, He's a believer, so he's testifying on Joseph's behalf. He'd been involved in money digging with him. He said the prisoner was requested to look for a chest of money, did look, pretended to know where it was, and that the prisoner, Thompson, and Yeomans went in search of it, that Smith arrived at the spot first. This was at night. That Smith looked into his hat while there, and when very dark, told how the chest was situated. After digging several feet, they struck upon something sound like, sounding like a board or a plank. And they said, Eureka, we've got it. But then the prisoner would not look again into his hat, pretending that he was alarmed on account of the circumstances relating to the trunk being buried, which came all fresh to his mind at this point. That the last time he looked, he discovered distinctly the two Indians who buried the trunk, that a quarrel ensued between them, and that one of the said Indians was killed by the other and then thrown into the hole beside the trunk to guard it. As he supposed. And this all came back to Joseph, and that freaked him out. And so he wouldn't look in his hat anymore. Thompson said that he believes in the prisoner's professed skill, that the board which he struck with his spade upon was probably the chest, but on account of an enchantment, the trunk kept settling away from under them when digging, that notwithstanding, they continued constantly removing the dirt, yet the trunk kept about the same distance from them. So, again, it's another account. And he's relating here a separate instance to try to prove that Joseph Smith had this ability. And he says, we just could never quite get to it. We'd get right down to the chest and it'd sink farther into the earth. And we'd dig some more and it'd just keep sinking. We never quite could get there. So all these details come to light from this court record. Um, what's not clear from this court record is what the um, outcome of the trial was and whether or not Smith was found guilty or innocent. But the most likely outcome appears to be that Smith was given leg bail. And that is a nice way of saying they let him escape. That they looked at all of it and went, he's 20 years old, he's a stupid kid, is this really worth jail time for? Especially when Josiah Stowell, the man he's supposed to have defrauded, he's not complaining, right? He's like, I believe in him. Yep, I gave him money, right? He's not the one with the complaint. It's the family that's the one with the complaint. But the guy who was supposedly defrauded, he's not complaining. And so it appears that what they did is they kind of decided to, you know, leave the cell door open and look the other way and let him go. There's a couple accounts that uh, can lend credence to that. Here's uh, A.W. Benton, who is a resident of Bainbridge, who attended the trial. He was sitting in the courtroom that day and um, was a witness to the trial. He said that considering his youth, with his being a minor, he was about 20 at the time, thinking that he might reform his conduct, he was designedly allowed to escape. This was four or five years ago, and from this time he's absented himself from this place, returning only in private. So, you know, they kind of told him, man, get and knock it off, right? And so he did. He got out of Dodge and never came back and did that again. Another account from uh, Joel Noble, who was a justice of the peace in the same area at the same time. He wrote a letter years later where he said that Joe was condemned and the whisper came to Joe, off, off, get out of here. So he took leg bail and he was not seen in our town for two years or more 
except in dark corners. Like he only snuck back in mostly to see Emma, which we'll get back to in a minute. So he took off, but he kept sneaking back to see the girl, which it's always worth it for the girl, right? And so that's what uh, apparently happened. The problem is that for many years, Mormon scholars de denied any of this ever happened. The 1826 trial never took place. All of that account we just looked at came from a magazine article 50 years after the fact, right? And from notes that this lady supposedly got from the judge's daughter. And so for 100 years, the, the church's story was the trial never took place. He was never arrested. None of it ever happened. This is all just anti-Mormon propaganda that people are trying to slander the prophet. And everybody's just out to get him, but none of it ever happened. And sometimes they said it in very strong terms. Francis Kirkham was one of the first LDS-like professional apologists. He wrote a book called A New Witness for Christ in America in 1942. It's one of the first LDS apologetic works where he's writing specifically to defend the Book of Mormon and how it came about. And in that book, he's answering about this trial record. And he says, no such record was ever made and therefore is not in existence. Never happened. The Deseret News said in 1946 in the church section that this account of the trial is a fabrication of unknown authorship and never in the court records at all. So again, never happened. John Widso, who is an LDS apostle in 1951, He's a member of the Quorum of the Twelve. He said, this alleged court record seems to be a literary attempt of an enemy to ridicule Joseph Smith. There was no existing proof that such a trial was ever held. So, never happened. Hugh Nibley said, and if, if you know uh, church history at all, Nibley is a very significant LDS church uh, scholar, very, very prominent. Nibley said, if this court record is authentic... It is the most damning evidence in existence against Joseph Smith. So this is in 1967. He said it earlier, but that's when that account comes from. He says, if this existed, that's damning evidence, right? Because you have our prophet who's been visited by God. He's been visited by Moroni five times, and then every year on the anniversary of that visit, he's been visited by him again. In this meantime, running around, doing occult things like money digging and using peep stones and uh, all of this. My favorite account, though, because this comes from one of the LDS, from their sacred works. So in the Pearl of Great Price, there's Joseph Smith's history. And this is his account of that time period. This is included in, this is one of their standard works, right? And what we would call scripture, it's in one of their standard works, where Smith, writing in 1838, says this. He says, In October of 25, I hired with an old gentleman by the name of Josiah Stowell. Stowell. He took me with the rest of his hands to go dig for the silver mine, at which I continued to work for nearly a month without success. I prevailed with the old gentleman to cease digging after it. I convinced him finally to stop. And hence arose the very prevalent story of my having been a money digger. Now, this is significant, I think, because so the, Joseph wrote this in 1838. By then, the church is eight years old. It's growing. It's thousands of members. He's becoming a very prominent person. And so he's writing now to answer all of these accusations that were swirling around then about his being a money digger. And they were prominent enough accusations that he felt like he had to address them, right? And so he says... I did go in 1825, and we did dig for a silver mine, but there wasn't any money digging or peep stones or anything, you know, cultish going on. We were just digging for a mine, and I finally prevailed on him to stop. And that's how all these crazy rumors got started about me being a money digger. But he's denying that he ever did uh, work as a money digger uh, in saying so. But he's addressing it, so we know at least the rumors were there, right? So for a hundred years, this was the church's party line. Never happened, never happened, never happened, never happened, never happened. And then 
In 1971, this interesting little piece of paper was found. When these religion researchers were digging around in the basement of the uh, county jail there in Bainbridge, New York, and they found a couple damp boxes of water-damaged old court records dating back all the way to the early 1830s. And one of the court records they found was this piece of paper which is a receipt from Judge Neely for his services for the day. So he's just saying on this piece of paper, I conducted this trial, here's my charges. I conducted this trial, here's my charges. I conducted this trial, and here's my charges. So it's a receipt for his services, but right there in the middle of that piece of paper, we read this, and it's hard to make out if you're uh, looking at it there, but here's what it says in the middle of that piece of paper in that highlighted section, the same, because it's one account after another. So the people versus Joseph Smith, the glass looker. March 20th, 1826. For misdemeanor charges, to my fees and examination of the above cause, $2.68. So I tried the case of the people versus Joseph Smith, the glass looker, on this date, and here's my fees for um, hearing that trial. So you put that together, this receipt confirms Joseph Smith was tried as a glass looker, just like the previous account said. The charges of $2.68 match exactly what was given in the Fraser's Magazine account 100 years before. The date of March 20th, 1826 also matches the date given in the magazine. And when this initially came out after some hemming and hawing and trying to say it was a forgery and not legit, the church finally had to concede this is a legitimate document. The trial really did happen. It really did take place. Which is a problem for Francis Kirkham, who said, you might remember, in this book in the 40s, A New Witness for Christ in America. And this is an LDS apologist. He says, if any evidence had been in existence that Joseph Smith had used a seer stone for fraud and deception, and especially had he made this confession in a court of law as early as 1826, or four years before the Book of Mormon was printed, and this confession was in a court record, it would have been impossible for him to have legitimately organized the restored church. I think that's significant. And again, my intent, I, I am not trying to beat up on the character of Joseph Smith. Young people do stupid things. Most of us wouldn't want everything we did at 1820 pulled out. Or 1820. If, I don't want any of the things I did in 1820 to come. <laughs> we wouldn't want the things we did when we were 20, <laughs> right? Most of us did things at 20 we wouldn't be really proud of. So I'm, I'm not trying to demean the character of Joseph Smith. But here you have an LDS apologist who realizes the significance of what this means for the founding of the church. That if you have a young man who's been visited by God the Father and Jesus Christ and told not to join any of the churches, that they're all corrupt, and then in 1823 he's visited five times in a 24-hour period by Moroni, and, t and shown the golden plates. He's not allowed to take them, but he has shown the golden plates. Five times he's visited by Moroni, and then every year from 1823 to 1827 on the anniversary, he goes back to the hill, and he's visited by Moroni again, and again shown the plates and saying, no, you can't take them yet. So that's going on every year in this time period. If in that same period of time you have this same young man running around making his profession as a money digger involved in occult practices like this, openly admitting to it in court, that's not a good look for somebody who's called to be a prophet of God. And it certainly doesn't lend credence to his story when he denies in their scripture that he ever did it in the first place and says it was all, you know, it was all rumors running around. But I, I wasn't actually doing any of that when it's evident, it's overwhelmingly evident that he did. And when we get to 
when he starts translating the plates next week, it becomes even uh, clearer that he, he carries those same practices that he's been doing for the last four years as a money digger. We'll see him doing the same practices in translating the Book of Mormon, and it all just kind of flows from one into the other. And so if we are wrestling with the question whether Joseph Smith is a prophet who, who restored the church on earth, just looking at the history of this, you get, we have to wrestle with that, right? Could he have been who he said he was if all of this was going on at the same time? Back up just one second to go back to that blooming romance for just a minute. It's in this same period that he met Emma and they fell in love. Smith's dad uh, couldn't stand him. Um, so following his arrest, Smith kept coming back to the area to see her. When he asked Emma's father for permission to marry, he flatly refused. In fact, he kicked, her, kicked him out of his house and said, not on God's green earth. That's not his exact words, but he said, no way, you're not marrying my daughter. But Stowell, who was very fond of the couple and wanted to see them get together, he arranged for Emma to come and visit him in Bainbridge, which is it's all connected there to um, where she was in Pennsylvania. He arranges for her to come and see him while her dad was out of town. And while there, her and Joseph were secretly married on January 28, 1827. And then Joe takes her back to Palmyra, Manchester area, where they moved in with his parents. And her dad was not happy about it. But he snuck his daughter off in the middle of the night. But this whole period effectively did accomplish something that probably a combination of Emma's influence and getting arrested and going to trial and getting leg bail, all of this, enough, it scared Smith enough that there, it seemed like his money digging practices stopped there with that trial. He didn't do it anymore after that that we can tell. They moved back to Pennsylvania and not long, so that's January of 1827, they move in with his parents. He stops money digging, but that's when he starts talking about golden plates buried somewhere under the earth. And so he's going to go a, little, a different direction, but the money digging stops at that point. Somebody tell me what time it is. 1040. 1040. All right. I'm not sure where to fit this in, but we're going to plow through real quick. You ready? So we're going to go back the same 1820 to 1827 period. We've talked about money digging. We've seen where that fits in the story and what was going on. How does magic and masonry have a play in Joseph Smith's life in that same period? And all of this is crucial for the Book of Mormon story that's coming up later. Here's what his mom says in her autobiography. Uh, and she's writing in her autobiography um, to... Uh, answer charges that the Smith family was lazy, and that ticked her off. So in answering the charges that they were considered lazy, she says, don't let my reader suppose that we stopped our labor and went at trying to win the faculty of Abrac, drawing magic circles or soothsaying to the neglect of all kinds of business. We never during our lives suffered one important interest to swallow up every other obligation. And so you sort that out. What she's saying there is, don't think we just stopped working to pursue these other things. We never let one obligation like work stop another obligation. So what she's saying, we did both. But we weren't lazy. We worked and practiced the faculty of abrac and magic circles and soothsaying. So three specific things she mentions there that the family was involved in. Uh, drawing magic circles, that was an important ritual for gaining power over evil spirits. And you might remember in some of the accounts from last week where they would dig for buried treasure and they had to do a circle of stakes around, you know, to keep the enchantment and to keep the spirits away. And so we saw Smith doing that even in his money digging practices. Soothsaying is an old fashioned term for telling the future through tools like tarot cards, or we're all familiar with crystal balls or seer stones or peep stones. The faculty of Abrac that she said that they pursued, though, that's a little more obscure for us today, 
but abrac or abrac abracax originated, that's all the way back to the second century, all the way back to a, a form of Gnosticism where abrac was the chief of the 365 genies that ruled the days of the year. And by the Middle Ages, it had evolved to where peasants in the Middle Ages came to believe that the use of Abrek's name had magical powers. And perhaps you've heard of the word abracadabra, right? That's where that comes from in magic shows even today, where to get the protective powers of Abrek, abracadabra, you would write in this kind of pyramid form where you would drop a letter on, on every line to where you get that pyramid shape and then you would take that parchment and place it around the neck of a sick person to ward off illness and there was a whole ritual you would take it afterwards and you know throw it into a creek over your left shoulder um, that was all involved in warding off illness and so she's openly admitting we were practicing the faculty of Abrek that they believed in these kinds of things that same, the faculty of Abrek was especially popular with Freemasonry in the 1800s, and it was especially prominent in the area where Joseph Smith grew up. And there was a lot in the 1820s, particularly in upstate New York, there was a ton of debate about Masonry. It was huge, it was growing, it was popular, and there's a lot of debate about it, and a lot of debate in religious circles about it, and so there's just a lot of arguing going on about masonry. Um, we know that at the time, Joseph Smith did become a mason, but not until 1842. And so early on, he was very opposed to masonry. But anyway, it was all, there was a lot of influence of masonry in their area. It's possible that Smith got part of his idea of the golden plate story from the Freemason legend of Enoch, uh, which was very popular in the Freemason monitor in this time period, um, and just real fast, there is an LDS historian named Reed Durham. So he was an LDS historian, faithful member of the LDS church, remained a faithful member of the LDS church, as far as I'm aware. I think he's even still alive today in his 90s, if I remember right. He was the leader of the LDS Institute of Religion in Salt Lake City. But he's remembered today mostly for this paper that he gave at the keynote address of the Mormon Historical Association in 1974 because it caused quite a stir. He highlighted all the similarities between Mormonism and, Free and the Freemasonry of the early 1800s. In that uh, address, he gave all of these similarities between the Freemason legend of Enoch and the, and the Mormon account of the golden plates. Uh, that they both involve a vision of God in which divine instructions are given. They both involve golden plates that are engraved in a special language that only the faithful can read. That there's an important hilltop and mountain with treasure buried underneath it, with important records that have been prefer, pre preserved for centuries. And there's a special servant of God chosen to find the plates. And so... He's just going, wow, that's a lot of similarities between the story Joseph Smith told, right? And in the Freemason story, it's Enoch who has the record buried under the hill, and, you know, and he goes and finds it. And, but he says there's similarities. His conclusion was this. How does a Mormon historian interpret Joseph Smith and the Masonic Enoch legend? The parallels demand an answer. Was Joseph Smith the fruition of Enoch's prophecy? Was this an extreme grabbing on by the prophet? Or did mysterious and divine, even magical forces attach themselves to him? But can anyone deny that Masonic influence on Joseph Smith and the church, either before or after his personal Masonic membership, the evidence demands comments? He says the evidence is so overwhelming of the link between the founding of the church and Masonry that we have to figure out, guys, as good Mormons, we have to figure out how do these two line up? We can see it today, and I just don't know. What time is it? I'm going to stop, I think. Ten till. Ten till. I, think, I, 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 wanted, I wanted to get this in, but I just don't think I'm going to get it all in. I want to leave time for questions, and I want to not have to rush through uh, some of this where we see the, the Masonic influence very clearly in the founding of Mormonism and even in the text of the Book of Mormon itself. 
And so I don't want to rush that. And so I think we'll pick up there next week. Uh, if you're watching today, you're watching online, we want you to know we love you. We'd love to talk to you about any of these things. Uh, we'd love to get together and chat and do so in a loving way. But I hope for everybody this has been helpful. We will continue on from here next week. Let's pray, and then we will have uh, time for any questions you may have.